Hello, and welcome to the second Mexican American Studies Symposium, sponsored by the Department of English Literature and Language. My name is Margaret Cantu Sanchez, and I am an instructor of English and the founder and director of the Mexican American Studies Symposium. Given the recent focus on systemic racism and anti racism efforts, this year's theme is anti racism and Latinx Chicanx cultures and communities. We have two sessions scheduled. Our first session following this introduction consists of nine presentations by undergraduate and graduate doctoral students from a wide range of disciplines and majors, including political science, computer science, theology, English, public history, and counseling, among others. Each presenter and presentation will focus on an interdisciplinary approach to anti-racism as it pertains to Latinx, Chicanx cultures and communities and explorations of topics including immigration, violence against Mexican Americans, and cultural traditions as resistance, and domestic abuse among Latinas and other issues. A second session will follow via a webinar discussion with three Latinx Chicanx activists and scholars also pertaining to this year's theme. I would like to thank Drs. Maloney and Hill and our entire Department of English, Literature and Language for their support. I would also like to thank professors in various departments from the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, as well as Dean Leona Palanche for their support. This program would not be possible without the support of Dr. Alicia Tate, the Center for Catholic Studies, and the Edward and Linda Speed Catholic Studies Faculty Development and Research Fund. Lastly, I would like to thank my assistant and co-moderator, Cassandra Yardini, all our student presenters for their efforts, and all those who have assisted in making this program possible. We hope that you enjoy these presentations and more importantly, that they will serve as encouragement and inspiration to engage in similar research and social justice projects. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maggie Amador, and today I'll be presenting about the impact of gender and racial bias in minorities. I would like to begin my presentation with the foundations of what inspired me to research this topic in general. I'm a Latina in the field of technology. That being said, I'm a woman, a woman of color, and a woman in a field dominated by men. Therefore, I'm quite literally facing the impact of gender and racial bias in minorities, and what better topic to do than one that is directly impacting me. Implicit bias can be defined as an unconscious form of prejudice about someone or something. Bias is ingrained in society and passed down to generations through the influence of literature, media, and older generations who refuse to see a certain group of people as more than the single story they were once taught or witnessed. We are currently living in a historical time in which change is being invoked. This change has sprouted from the groups who no longer tolerate being subjected to stereotypes and harmful biases. We will review the implications of bias today, how it has been prevalent in our history, and what we can do to make a change. Let us begin with defining what intersectionality is. Intersectionality brings together race, sexual orientation, gender, nationality, and social class, and shows how all these factors can shape an individual's life. Intersectionality is important because it allows us to take into consideration the privileges that certain like minorities lack due to the social factors that limit them. This ties into implicit bias because many biases are based off of the intersectionality of the factors that I just listed. So where can we begin eliminating bias? In recognizing one's own bias, they are better equipped to adjust when encountering a situation in which it may result in prejudice. To attempt to tackle the elimination of implicit bias, we must begin with the younger generations. In a research report by Danielle Perzik, she explains how gender and racial bias are prevalent in children as young as four to five years old. In the analysis of children and their biases, we are better equipped on how we can correct these biases before they become permanent and begin to affect the life of the child or impact their, or their impact on the lives of others. The report suggests that by introducing children to different races and genders, 
it can help eliminate intersectional bias because their racial and gender preferences can be deconstructed. The elimination of bias in the future generations is necessary because of how harmful bias can be towards minorities. People of color and women have notoriously been on the bottom of the social hierarchy and are victims of prejudice throughout the years and still today. While it is not to discount the growth that society has had, it is to say that we are far from removing prejudice from society. Today, we are unlikely to witness someone being turned away from a store or job because of the color of their skin or their gender, but we are likely to hear microaggressions, whether intentional or not. Microaggressions can be the result of internalized oppression due to the environment one grew up in. Literature has shown that the impact of microaggressions can be detrimental to physical, mental, and emotional health of a person being oppressed. We are currently living in a historical time in which change is being invoked. People are no longer tolerating the biases that they have been suffering through. And through implicit bias, we believe stereotypes that hinder the opportunities women and people of color have in the world. The intersectionality of these two topics leads me to my deeper analysis of how harmful bias will impact women and people of color as we progress towards the future. So as the world progresses, we are beginning to see the consequences of bias in our technology. Society is beginning to engulf itself in technology and it is at the tip of our fingers and implemented in nearly every interaction we have with society today. This leaves us to consider how bias between race and gender can impact minorities through technology as we move towards this new world. Negative biases become imposed when there's a lack of diversity in the community to help offset the harmful stereotypes. The field of technology is no exception to this. It is becoming apparent that in the way that algorithms are training themselves with artificial intelligence. In a book by Osonde Osaba, he analyzes the risk and consequences of bias in artificial intelligence. Osoba specifically reviews the US criminal justice system and their increasing use of algorithmic tools. As of recent events throughout the past few years, it is clear that there are immense biases already within the system without technology. But when the system resorts to technology to eliminate this bias, what happens when the technology is biased as well? Osoba discussed how an algorithm that uses historic records to determine which areas should be more surveilled can result in inequitable criminalization in which criminals with different demographic characteristics have systematically different likelihoods of apprehension. This is a way in which the system is failing us again. Technology fails us because technology is being made with bias. The historical data that is used to create the algorithm is a victim of years of unjust violence and stereotypes against certain demographics. We have to find an alternate solution in which we can not only remove the bias, but remove it for generations to come and the, our current society. We need to combat bias in STEM to help counteract the negative effects it is having now and the effects it will continue to have in the future if left unchanged. In an article by Lynn Farrell, she explores the implicit and explicit biases between gender and STEM. Research has found that women in STEM are less likely to identify with certain feminine characteristics, such as wearing makeup. This lack of femininity can highlight just how bias is playing a role in the identity of women trying to make a name for themselves in this male-dominated field. While it can be said that these women may not identify with stereotypical male-dominated traits, it is unknown whether they have a choice or if they feel as though they will not be taken as seriously by their male counterparts. The article mainly focuses on gender, but the same situation can be applied to race. People of a different race don't have the luxury of being able to dress down or even wear certain hairstyles in their career fields because of how they want to remove themselves from the stereotypes that may be given to them by their coworkers. When we bring the two together, we can begin to ponder how intersectionality may result in a woman of color being drawn away from the field of STEM because they're not taken seriously if they're too feminine 
yet not doing enough feminine things can result in them looking like they are not professional. If women or people of color become uncomfortable in their careers, they will be less enticed to join them and go and seek more inclusive environment or career field. To begin working our way to removing bias, we must begin considering our own biases and what we can do to adjust them. By beginning to recognize our own biases, we'll be better equipped to ensure we're not perpetuating harmful stereotypes and we can better help to correct others who may be helping feed into the harmful biases against minorities. In promoting self-awareness, we can be less likely to contribute to detrimental effects of having a bias against race or gender. This being said, we can begin to tackle the systematic biases that prevent certain races or genders um, from being able to climb the social ladder. By implementing systematic safeguards, we can ensure that bias, whether it be conscious or unconscious, does not play a role in removing the opportunity from someone. As we've seen in the Black Lives Matter movement going on before our eyes, it is no longer enough to be complacent with the life that we have grown accustomed to living. We must create a better world for the generations that follow so that the books in which we witness the effects of bias on women and race become a thing of the past and no longer can be related to the life people must endure today. As quoted from Sally Haslanger, social justice will never be achieved by just working to change beliefs for the habits of body, mind, and heart are usually more powerful than argument. Therefore, we must work to change more than beliefs and find a deeper change in society as a whole. Thank you for listening to my presentation and have a great day. Hi, my name is Alia Costilla, and the title of my presentation is Violence Against Indigenous and Latina Women, an Unintentional Result of Sexism. A common characteristic that is readily used as an identifiable feature is one's sex. Typically, this can include either male or female categories that one has to undertake. As a person's born with sex customarily defines the trajectory of their life encounters, such as sexism. Another frequently used distinction is a person's race. This can indicate the likelihood to experience collective privilege or discrimination. Thus, what if a person is born into two minority classes? It can be theorized that as a result of the status of race and sex, the instilled hierarchy of society will see these women in a submissive role. This can be analyzed by the result of violence against indigenous Native American and Latina women. For causal reference, we turn to the patriarchal issue of sexism. It is evident Latina and Native American women experience greater chances of this aggression. By utilizing literary works and research, a comparative analysis will be used to determine reasoning that may be assumed by colonization and discrimination of minority classes in the United States. Based on the content of this topic, Nermas Cantu's Canicula and Leslie Soko's Ceremony can be referenced for the display of minority status, patriarchy, and violence against women. From a historical standpoint, the insight that can be brought to comprehend reasoning for sexism that results in violence against indigenous and Latina women is by divulging the origin and history of such practices or beliefs that instilled such a concept from the beginning. The rooted concept of feminism as described in Latina culture will be described in referencing mother archetypes. While the Native American origination can be understood from colonization and how it contributed to an internalized patriarchy. Among Latinos, the Roman Catholic religion has a strong presence that has adopted archetypes from literature. According to Heredia's Malinches, Lloronas, and Guadalupanas, the three figures are archetypes that represent women into a binary that is given to uphold the patriarchy. Based on each de depiction, they portray a certain mode of suppressive characteristics that classify women alike. Overall, the three figures configure a dichotomous divide for Latinas to follow. 
and be classified as. In Native American culture, by analyzing colonization efforts that incurred in the United States, we see a trend of oppression. Authors Burnett and Figley attempt to conceptualize a framework of Native American women who have experienced violence. In their work, they identify historical oppression that began with European American colonization of indigenous Native American land. Through this onset of internalized oppression, it became self-perpetuating onto marginalized groups, including women. It can be seen as a learned aspect from Europeans who normalized the concept of oppression that justified violence against women. When both races are compared, they have vast similarities that arise out of distinct histories. After the historical reference has been established, there is now an ability to evaluate the issue of violence against Indigenous and Latina women and what that looks like currently and its significant role of oppression. This evidence is inclusive of specific data through statistics, academic case studies, and case law that has translated into policy within the last few decades. A study of interest that has ascribed to the issue of violence against Latinas, in this case Hispanics, was clear in gender studies cemetery, sexism, and intimate partner violence. Their goal was to examine a hypothesis that women's violence is reactive and men's is proactive in consideration of benevolent and hostile sexism by the use of over 200 Hispanic men and women. The results showed that the violence women displayed is in reaction to a man's violence against them. The highest rates of hostile sexism revealed to be against those who challenged patriarchal norms. However, women who had benevolent attitudes toward sexism were less likely to define situations of abuse. Recent work from 2018 showcases continued relevance and accuracy to former case studies. Authors of Latina and Caribbean immigrant women experiences with intimate partner violence saw it a qualitative study to determine how Latina Caribbean immigrant women and their experiences of violence correlated to gender stereotypes. Their case study consisted of 30 Latina and Caribbean immigrant women and in their interviews, relevant facts and insight that came to light. The type of abuse varied, but was extremely prevalent. The root reasoning that was exposed and confirmed in the 2008 study was the refusal to meet gender stereotypes. However, in most cases, when women migrated to the United States, they felt empowered to change their current situations. This demonstrates that traditional gender roles are reasoning to initiate violence and continue it while levels of adherence can dictate hostile or benevolent sexism among Latina women in particular. Regarding Native American women and their victimization of violence reference from honoring sovereignty, the authors explicitly offer background knowledge on the matter and an outline of the criminal jurisdictions of in Indian country while providing resources through congressional efforts and policy recommendations. Similar to the article utilized in, histor in the historical reference section, they believe violence was learned by colonization. However, they offer informative norms prior to European colonization that state Native American women were seen as life givers and life sustainers. They were respected. But with the change of power structures afterwards, violent behavior was learned. For the reason of continued relevance and high rates, they rely on the historical governing ability of native nations to be dwindled through Supreme Court jurisprudence and legislation. Thus, protections are restricted by jurisdictional constraints. As a result of Worcester v. Georgia, where the court held the state Georgia could not pass legislation that affects the residing Indian nations and Opliant versus Squamish Indian tribe where the court held tribes could not utilize jurisdiction over non-natives. There, there has been a confusion of jurisdictions ever since. As a result of this gray area, lawful protections 
over Native women who suffer from violence at rates more than twice as often than any other ethnic group are deprived of legal recourse and accountability. By comparison of both races and their current dilemma, Latina women experience violence when they attempt to reject patriarchal norms rather than Native American women who fall through the cracks of legal aid and are seen as a vulnerable group in comparison to men. Differences in their prevailing continuance are used to examine for potentially beneficial policy that could be implemented towards specific minority groups. Depictions of the issue of violence against Native Americans and Latina women alone is useless without proposed implications for policy in the future. Thus, we turn to the implications that have been suggested by previous literature and current laws that could be altered or passed. Among the Latina group, there are various obstacles they face when attempting to report their experiences of violence. Tanzola, in her dissertation, Barriers of Being Undocumented, suggests not only the difficulties faced by Latina women without documentation, but also the population as a whole. According to the Violence Against Women's Act, it does not require an immigrant woman to have legal immigration status. However, because of fear of deportation, which is commonly assumed as the most, the only form of punishment, reported, reporting of such crimes are slim to none. Thus, women within this group are highly vulnerable because of pre-existing gender bias and generalizations of immigrants as criminals. There are also limitations all Latina space, including language barriers, lack of knowledge regarding protections, and being ostracized. Hence, these difficulties provide combative policy suggestions. This could also include allocating funds to nonprofits who are capable of providing diverse language services and allow the victim's identity, identity to remain confidential. By doing so, would create a safe environment for women without fear of repercussions based on their status. I would also suggest community educational programs where there are dense Latina populations that allow women to know their rights. That way they are aware of how to protect themselves. For Native American women, the issue of jurisdictional confusion hinders the ability to receive justice in cases of domestic violence. Since this allows for crimes to be committed without accountability, an area of focus for policy concern would have to address the lack of authority to encompass this area that puts the lives of indigenous women at risk. Therefore, we turn to the authors Hart and Walter suggestions that directly focus on this issue. They suggest for Congress to allocate resources to the federal government to prosecute cases of domestic violence where tribes do not have a jurisdiction to prosecute. This would be beneficial to native women who are victims of non-Indians. That way, they're able to charge the offenders without limitations of racial status. Regarding intraracial instances, Congress should provide financial resources to tribes that allow for proper accountability and guidelines that assure women are given services in such cases. cases. These resources could provide safe havens for abused Native women and affordable representation. By analyzing the topic of violence against women and a theoretical claim as a causal factor could be sexism. It arose out of the concept of machismo in Mexican culture. Hence, patriarchal ideals are ingrained in today's society. The curiosity to potentially find a causative reason for violence against minority groups, women, seems to coincide with traditional norms of male superiority. The comparative analysis was utilized to potentially identify if this issue of violence has a similar link in most minority groups, or whether it was unique to Latinos. After careful analysis, it was found that within the Latino race, resisting gender norms of patriarchy cause and continue violence. While among Native Americans, violence was a learned idea as a result of colonization and remained because of the lack of repercussions on offenders. Thus, my theory that sexism leads to violence against women proves correct among Latinos, but incorrect from natives. However, 
in a sense. My theory is functional in explaining indigenous people's higher rates of violence, because while violence was learned, it continues for a superiority complex that is unable to be illegally addressed. Whether it be intended or culturally aware sexism, it still exists. Therefore, continued analysis that is capable of referencing a statistical case study would be beneficial not only to the world of academia, but the lives of minority women in the United States. Thank you for your attention to this crucial issue I chose to, brought, to bring forth today. Have a great day. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Ulig. I am an English and theology major here at St. Mary's University. I'm in my junior year. And last year in spring 2020, I took a collaborative course with the University of Dayton uh, with Professor Dr. DeAnda. And we talked about injustices and discrimination of Latinx people and talking about indigenous culture and religious culture and how people were able to create a sacred space within these places of injustice, such as the immigration system. Uh, we watched a lot of documentaries in, in the class. We did a lot of research and me and my group, which was part of the collaboration of University of Dayton and St. Mary's, um, I worked with Samuel and Marissa from St. Mary's and Tyler from University of Dayton. And together we created a Prezi virtual rosary that included these different topics of the injustices that were present and that we, that we researched. We talked about sexism and racism regarding the Latinx people, the migration and the sacred, um, labor in relation to sacred space and understanding ecological environments with focus on religious practices and sacred spaces. We also touched on the characteristics of Emeritus education and the Emeritus charism. And each of the five topics that I just mentioned form the Hail Mary beads of the rosary. We wanted to educate people while also giving them the opportunity to pray for what we are talking about. Because we felt that as a Marianist institution, both places, we are able to create that space. And we're also able to share this information while also explaining how we were able to come together and create it. Um, my project really, our, our project really wanted to touch on um, praying for those who are not able to be themselves, who have had hid their culture just to fit into this space. Um, most of our research talked about how people were pushed out of their homes or people are leaving their homes to find a better life. And when they are sitting there waiting to be accepted into the country or waiting to just find a safe space, their religion is what they cannot take away. Um, people are able to create these sacred spaces to find places of prayer. And we had the idea of making a virtual rosary because in our research, we found that rosaries were left behind as remnants of those who were there and standing and waiting in that place, that place of wanting to find a home, wanting to have a better life. Our research talked about how there is an importance and relevance of culture and heritage and practices of tradition. And you should be able to feel free to practice and be who you are. And we've found that maybe these who, people who are considered minorities are not able to do so because you need to speak English. You need to go back to where you came from these people really needed just to, and they have the right to migrate. Uh, we've talked about Catholic social teaching and how does this correlate with the idea of people moving. We also talked about the ecological connections between people, forming those communities and relationships to support people during these times. We talked about social teaching and regarding justice. And how, how are we as Catholics supposed to see these people and how do we work with, with that? How do we pray for them? How do we support them? And how do we see that they have the right to be here? 
We also looked at Laudato Si from Pope Francis, and we talked about our common home, talking about the common good of a person with inalienable rights, and they're able to freely move and have freedom to do so. They're also able to practice their, their culture. The significance of this project, like I mentioned earlier, is the, is the ability to, um, what you're able to carry with you, which is your faith. Um, you're able to carry your faith and continue to move forward. We talked about how their voices are not being heard, respected or projected, but their prayer life can still project their voice to God, to give them the strength, to give them a place of community and home. In this project, we were able to put um, different, different emphasis on those who were in this system, those who just feel like they're not supported. Um, we talked about One thing I wanted to say though, is that we, we wanted this to be prayerful and reflective because this is a current situation that we are talking about. We were also talked about ancestral connections with those people. We talked about connections with the ancestors, um, how, some, how some people, indigenous cultures, they have connections with their ancestors. They talked about their recipes or their traditions or um, voices with the ancestor talking, maybe see them in dreams. And people cannot be able to take that away from someone else. Uh, people should be able to be who they were raised to be. I wanted to talk about a couple of people that we, we uh, researched in class and what we talked about. Lo cotidiano, which means the everyday struggle minority space. We were able to learn about different terms that people use to emphasize this struggle. And it gives me a different perspective on how to see the importance, but also those who are there and what do they bring to the table. I, I also like looking at the topic La Lucha, which is the struggle of the immigrants or Hispanic minorities. And how do we, getting a liberal arts education, look at how to see this topic and understand why are we learning this now and what can we be called to do? That's what this research kind of felt like. It was, we, we were able to talk about it. We were able to maybe watch videos and understand what is going on and see how important a sacred space is. So our, when our project focuses on creating those sacred spaces, it's talking about maybe finding a place to pray, finding a place to make that that place where we can understand that that's the one thing that someone cannot take away. And when these rosaries are left behind, it's a sign of dignity and respect for those who were previously there. As I said earlier, this project was a collaboration between me and three other classmates um, in the middle of the pandemic when it just started. And uh, it's, it's very exciting to work with. I was very happy with how it came out. I have the link to the Prezi if anyone here would like to see it. I, I don't know how to attach it, but it's still able to be presented and people can still see it. They can also pray along with it if you'd like. Um, and I think it's really cool that we were able to commit, contribute uh, the merriness in there. And how does that work considering that's our connection together, our ecological connection. And um, I guess how we were able to bring us together to make this project, but also to pray together. And I think the power of prayer is super cool, especially considering how we were looking at how people in this struggle were able to continue to pray, even in times of struggle. Um, this project was also interviewed for Marianist Alive magazine for the, um, for the detail in the work, how it was just, um, it was an interactive project. People can actually interact with this project and understand what we, what we did and also pray on it. Thank you guys so much for uh, listening. I, I truly appreciate it. If you would like more detail on my project, I am I'm happy to give more detail, but thank you for being here and I'll see you next time. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone viewing the presentation for the Mexican American Symposium. My name is Paul Garza, and I will be telling you the story of Antonio Gomez. The title of my presentation is The Untold Stories of Mexican American Lynchings. We have Antonio Gomez, who is a 14 year old Mexican child in the year 1911. Um, he was walking home carving pieces of wooden shingles with a pocket knife. On his way home, he happens to pass by a saloon. The saloon owner goes out and shoves Antonio Gomez to the sidewalk, telling him that the sidewalk was no wastebasket for him to leave his drippings. A group of men that was at the saloon cheered on the owner and egged him on as they cursed at Gomez. As the boy tried to gather his shingles and tried to leave, a man by the name of Charles Z. Shing snatched the wooden shingles from the boy's hand and told the owner that he could essentially make him stop the littering. Zisheng whipped, whipped Antonio Gomez with his own wooden shingles, while other men watched and ridiculed the boy. Um, remember, so this is a child, a 14-year-old boy, Antonio Gomez, out of self-defense, stabbed Zisheng with the pocket knife he was using to carve the wooden shingles. Zisheng died from blood loss in 20 minutes. Antonio Gomez was taken almost immediately into custody by Constable McCoy of the town of Thorndale, Texas. Constable McCoy took him to the town jail, which is in Thorndale, Texas. Soon after his arrest, many different versions of this altercation went around. Some were claiming that Gomez was the attacker or the perpetrator who waited for Zisheng to come out of the saloon after having snatched his wooden shingle and peacefully retreating to the saloon. Many people were so eager to bring their own justice and to have a swift justice that they were willing to act as witnesses and to act as victims. They were saying almost anything to get Antonio Gomez to be prosecuted. This is not something we are sure of what happened. We're not sure which story is the most accurate. The only part that remains constant in these events is what led up to his death, to the death of Antonio Gomez. Gomez became an instant target for lynching and for mob violence because these citizens knew he was too young for capital punishment in the state of Texas. They were willing to take matters into their own hands and which they did. It was reported that a mob of more than a hundred people waited for justice outside of the jail. The constable McCoy who placed Gomez in jail tried to transfer him to another jail out of fear that the boy would be lynched by the people. The constable knew all too well that the small jail could keep Antonio Gomez in, but he knew that sooner or later, the angry mob would be capable of getting in. Gomez was led through the back of the jail with a chain around his neck and straight to a house in an attempt to keep him safe and away from the mob. As McCoy went to look for reliable transportation to another jail, Gomez was kept in the safe place or what he thought was a safe place. And somehow it is unsure but we do know that the angry mob learned of the location of Antonio Gomez and managed to steal him from authorities. Antonio Gomez was captured by this angry mob and was dragged by a horseman who managed to grab him by the chain that was around his neck. Antonio Gomez's body was found lifeless hanging from a telegraph pole next to a ladder. Only three hours had passed since the death of the man that Gomez was charged for murdering. The body of the child was found bruised up and beaten horribly with a chain around his neck. After beating the boy and dragging him, the men who attacked him mercilessly suspended his body from the pole. Before these men were even able to successfully hang his body, they had a failed attempt in which his body fell to the floor and they kicked his head. This is horrible. He's a child who was murdered by these grown men, by a group of men and was lynched, all because these people wanted a swift justice and they wanted to take justice into their own hands. And of course, we know that the constable was too late when he arrived at the scene. And this is an important story for us. Um, we know that this was a Mexican American lynching. How often did these hate crimes occur? Apparently, these were very common in Texas history. There are records that show from 1848 to 1928, at least 597 deaths of Mexicans in Texas were due to mob violence or lynchings. And these are only the ones that were recorded. Um, these attacks directed towards Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were not only done by other citizens, 
but they were also planned systematically by Texas Rangers. For example, the Texas Rangers um, are well known in Texas, but another point of view from of them is they had very many planned raids in South Texas, which were targeted towards Mexicans and Mexican Americans. They committed acts of terror and not many people know this. Um, these acts of terror were very common in Texas, especially towards ethnic groups, such as African Americans, Mexicans, Mexican Americans, and even Native Americans who came even earlier in history. Mexican Americans were somewhat immune to racist Jim Crow policies of the South that made discrimination against Black Americans legal. And this was solely due to the fact that Mexicans were white by law since the signing of the Treaty of, of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. So in an attempt to make a more subtle group of policies, um, the Juan Crow laws emerged in Texas as a way to le legally discriminate against Mexican Americans. Through Juan Crow prejudices, Texas passed English only laws that led to future segregation of Mexican Americans in school systems. Anglos pushed for segregation of Mexican Americans in school because they believed in having their having their children learn alongside Mexicans and Mexican American children would hinder them. Segregationists also believed that it was safer for white children because they believed Mexican Americans reached puberty earlier. Um, these are all stereotypes that are perpetuated. Um, against color of people and against um, ethnic groups that aren't white. We see this with the black man and the white woman, these stereotypical scenarios. And unsurprisingly, these anti-Mexican efforts were blindsided by authorities across the state, giving more power to Juan Crow laws that essentially justify discrimination and mistreatment of Mexican Americans. This is something that has been perpetuated and we could even say that it is perpetuated today. Racism has roots that are very deep in the state of Texas. Racism in Texas stems back not only to slavery and to prejudice of black people, but we can even look as far back as the indigenous, indigenous Americans in Texas. Mexicans were sometimes saved by the law which would recognize a Mexican person as white as long as their skin permitted it. If you were not of fair skin, then you risk being persecuted. Most Anglo-Americans had an us versus them mentality when it came to Mexican-Americans. And this was because many Anglo-Americans picked up on the American nationalism and nativism, which put them against Mexican-Americans who were wrongly stereotyped. Mexican-Americans were usually seen as inferior, violent, and even anti-American. Mexican-American racism was more of a double-edged sword. Mexican-Americans had to deal with Anglo-Americans on this side of the border who didn't accept them and didn't think they were American enough, while simultaneously having to deal with Mexicans who also thought of them as less than and often thinking of them as traitors. Racism in the state of Texas was not only on the mere surface, this was something that has been implemented systematically. Um, it's in the school systems, it has been in the housing systems and even in labor systems and legal systems. And this is due to our country's story our history is based on consensus, which means that our history is based on points of view that seek to paint an exciting picture of our history while downplaying the tragedies that have occurred against different ethnic groups, um, such as against Black people, against Mexican Americans, Latinx, Chicanx, against Indigenous people. There is this erasure of people of color in our history. And this is why it is important to know the stories of such victims of racism and mob violence like that of Antonio Gomez. Although these stories aren't as appealing and they're a bit harder to swallow, it's important to recognize that these people and their stories are our history, whether we like it or not. It's important to know the truth and to know the history through more than one point of view. Stories like these are relevant today and it is important to us to stop the perpetuation and the erasure of Mexican American history, of Latinx history, of Chicanx history. It is up to us to stop these stereotypes, to fight back. And so these are stories that need to be told. These are stories that are important to us. Um, these stories are, we can ask ourselves, why haven't you heard of Antonio Gomez? When this is just unfortunately one of many lynchings, one of many situations. Why were Mexican-American studies 
um, classes just recently added to Texas public school curriculum as early as 2014. And why is it only an elective? Mexican American history is important to us. It is vital to who we are and especially to us in Texas where we have a long history of Mexican and Mexican American history here. Um, again, I just wanna say thank you to everyone viewing this and have a good rest of the presentation. And I hope you take this back home and you're able to start a spark in your life and fight back against these stereotypes. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Brianna Alexis Guillen and I am a senior biology major. Uh, the title of my presentation is Addressing and Treating the Alcoholism Health Disparity in Native American Communities. The books, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian and Ceremony give us a glimpse into the dark reality of American Indian alcoholic and substance abuse tendencies. Many of the characters in both books talk about having uh, or experiencing alcoholism and substance abuse. Um, many of them have deeper underlying issues. Native Americans, which are also referred to as American Indians and Alaskan Natives, make up a small percentage of the population, but yet they experience higher rates of substance abuse and addiction as compared to other ethnic groups. And statistics have shown that alcoholism is a serious issue that must be addressed and analyzed in the Native American communities. To begin addressing this issue, uh, we must understand the underlying psychological and sociological factors and um, with this knowledge we'd be able to uh, better implement culturally specific and culturally sensitive methods in therapy and treatment to hopefully make them more effective. This is relevant to people who identify as Latino or, Czech, Latino or Chicano because both groups share similar underlying factors that contribute to Native American alcoholism. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, reported that AI, the AI, AI population presented a higher rate of alcohol use disorder than the rest of the general population. They found that the uh, rate in the AI population was 7.1% as compared to 5.4% 5. 5. in the general population. SAMHSA also reported that as many as one in six American Indians in the age group of 12 to 17 have participated in underage drinking. This is the highest uh, rate in this specific age group. And like I said, it belongs to the American Indian population. National Institute on Drug Abuse implemented a survey and they found that AIs that live on reservations or in surrounding areas of reservations had a much higher use of alcohol compared to the national sample of the general population. And in another study conducted at the University of Washington, they found that AI adolescents that lived in reservations uh, had a higher rate of being drunk or reported a higher rate of being drunk than non-reservation AIs and white adolescents. Altogether, these studies prove uh, that there is an alarming pattern that needs to be pointed out and needs to be addressed. The underlying factors include economic disadvantage, intergenerational trauma, and cultural factors, and these uh, factors play into the alcoholism health disparity in Native American communities. First, economic disadvantage is characterized as having a poor education, uh, living in poverty, or having limited resources. And the AAC has found that economic disadvantage is a main contributor to the high rates of alcohol usage in the AI communities. They found that 20% of AIs um, are living in the poverty line or below the poverty line. And this is twice as much as the poverty rate in the Caucasian population in the United States. Higher socioeconomic status populations consume more alcohol. However, the lower socioeconomic status populations are more likely to experience the negative effects um, of excessive alcohol consumption. They experience higher rates of alcohol morbidity and mortality. This economic disadvantage is a result of many generations of oppress oppression by Anglos in the United States government. And this um, oppression, like I said, leads to dis uh, economic disadvantage. Uh, economic disadvantage and lower socioeconomic status are correlated to the negative effects of alcohol misuse and alcoholism in the AI communities. 
and um, this is a big contributor to the overall um, alcoholism and health disparity. Intergenerational trauma is another uh, important factor. Uh, the AIs were forcefully removed from their land um, that they inhabited for a very long time and they were punished for practicing their culture. This started um, a terrible uh, pattern of intergenerational trauma. Uh, examples of harsh treatment that they had to undergo was Indian Removal Act, the Indian Appropriations Act, and the Wounded Knee Massacre. The Indian Removal Act allowed for exchange of land between AIs and uh, Americans, but in reality, uh, this really just removed the AIs from their native land uh, to unsettled land in the West. It was signed into action in 1830 by President Andrew Jackson, and Britannica describes this best. And I quote, the rapid settlement of land east of the Mississippi River made it clear by the mid 1820s that the white man would not tolerate the presence of even peaceful Indians there. The significance of this uh, removal is that many of the tribes had developed spiritual connections to their lands, but this was not respected when they were basically kicked off of um, their own land. Indian Appropriations Act of 1851 created the reservation system that we know of today. And the significance of this is that um, the AIs were now restricted to certain borders and they were no longer able to hunt fish or gather their traditional foods. Uh, the Wounded Knee Massacre is one of many massacres that AIs had to go through, AI tribes. Um, in this massacre, the Sioux tribe fought the US Army and ended up losing 150 members of their tribe, most or at least half of those being women and children. And although this um, massacre only affected the Sioux tribe, there are many different, other, uh, many different massacres uh, such as the Sand Creek Massacre of the Cheyenne people and the Mendocino War of the Yuki people in California. The forceful removal of AIs from their native lands and the massacres are only a small part of a very long history of trauma. A sense of loss and detachment may cause stress, which is a very big risk factor for alcohol abuse tendencies and alcohol abuse disorder. Uh, this historical trauma is associated with depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and grief, all of which can make an individual more susceptible to alcohol abuse. Cultural factors also uh, play into alcoholism, and these include a sense of grief for the loss of their culture and general cultural practices. In the late 18, in the late 19th century, the AI children were required to go to boarding schools to assimilate more to Anglo and American culture. In these boarding schools, they were prohibited the usage of children's native names and languages. Uh, they faced consequences if they were found uh, engaging in their cultural or religious practices. This caused detachment of the AIs from their cultural roots, and this feeds into deeper emotional issues, especially unresolved grief, which is a product of many generations of emotional trauma. The AI population was found by the AAC to have a higher risk of experience psychological stress and needs. And we know that psychological stress um, is a big risk factor for alcoholism. Uh, the unresolved grief makes them more susceptible to using harmful coping mechanisms. Um, and this includes, like I said, alcohol misuse. Um, many of the Native Americans have also expressed uh, the belief that their cultural, uh, I'm sorry, that their cultural practices and their culture itself has a role in their uh, difficulty overcoming alcohol addiction. The connection to Latinx and Chicanx people is that uh, both groups share uh, common ground with uh, the AIs uh, in terms of the underlying factors. Uh, in terms of economic disadvantage, Latinos fall into the broader category of Hispanics and Hispanics share a similar poverty rates to AIs, 15.7% poverty rate for Hispanics and 20% for AIs. Uh, intergenerational trauma is also significant in um, this population. For example, the Fort Venid massacre uh, was a massacre in which the Texas Rangers murdered 15 men and boys that were unarmed. And um, this is one of the massacres that took 
place uh, following American colonization of Texas. Many of these play into the intergenerational trauma uh, that the Latinx and the Chicanx people face. This again is a risk factor or can play uh, into bad coping mechanisms, including alcohol misuse. Cultural factors, uh, people in Hispanic uh, communities can often be very private and may not want to talk publicly about their challenges at home as found by the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And they have a saying that says, la ropa sucia se lava en casa, which uh, loosely translates to don't air your dirty laundry in public. This makes it difficult for one to feel comfortable seeking treatment for alcohol use. In conclusion, alcoholism is a health disparity in the AI community and contributors uh, include economic disadvantage, intergenerational trauma, and cultural factors. And uh, the Latinx and Chicanx people share similarities in underlying factors of alcoholism in AI communities. Thank you so much for your time. Hi, um, my name is Victoria Villasenor, and I am a graduate student in the public history program at St. Mary's. And um, today I'm going to be sharing a bit of the work and research that I've been doing this past year um, in accordance with my capstone project. Um, so for the past year, I've been working with the Valle Frocorico de San Antonio um, to document their history as a dance studio and as a pioneer for the wider acceptance of Mexican culture throughout the city, state, and country. Um, so today I'm going to share a bit of that history and how practicing, performing, and documenting Vale Corico in the United States are ongoing efforts to combat racism and stereotypical perceptions of Mexican culture. Um, I will talk about the evolution of the Ballet Fracorico de San Antonio and their dedication to preserve the diverse culture of Mexico through dance. Their practice and visibility has influenced the growing appreciation and celebration of Mexican culture throughout San Antonio. Their success has helped establish Fracorico as a legitimate professional dance genre in Texas and inspired Fracorico art artists to establish their own studios throughout the state. This evolving goal is driven by their unwavering desire to change the narrative of Mexican dance from a cute folk dance to an art that requires years of historical study and experience to master. So, the Ballet Folclorico de San Antonio is the first folklorico dance company to hold the 501c3 status as an educational institute in San Antonio. The dance company was established in 1964 by a group of bilingual teachers in San Antonio looking to preserve Mexican culture for the surrounding community. This then small dance troupe was the first of its kind to showcase Mexican culture in San Antonio. This group began performing in local church events, festivals, and family um, parties. The Mexican community finally had their own form of entertainment that spoke to their traditions, um, and the city was taking note. Scholars like Dr. Daniela Garcia Mendoza from Laredo, Texas, um, has written that early folklorico groups formed as a form of protest inspired by the Chicano movement um, to openly embrace their culture. At the time, San Antonio was preparing to engage in cultural exchange with Mexico. The folklorico's uh, local success prompted the city to invite them to participate in this cultural exchange in 1965 which would set them on path towards citywide notoriety. Throughout the rest of the decade and into the 1970s, the Ballet Focorico would make connections with Focorico groups in Mexico, refine their skills and perform in larger venues and city events. City events such as the first Texas Folklife Festival in 1972, which they have continued to perform at ever since. This broadened their visibility and made Mexican dance one of the most desired forms of entertainment throughout the city. However, in looking at how newspapers wrote about these dances and this group, um, it seems like the company was only desired for their exotic presentations of Mexican folklore. Um, this conveys the underlying idea that stories, uh, that the stories portrayed in these dances were Mexican myths with little relevance to real life. However, throughout the 70s, as the Ballet Fracorico pushed for more visibility and citywide recognition, stories about Mexican culture started to change. 
In the meantime, their dance troupe began to grow. More Mexican Americans in San Antonio were seeking to openly embrace their culture. So just by expressing themselves, the Ballet Fricorico was turning the narrative of Mexican traditions around, and in doing so, empowered members in their community to reclaim their identity through art. Towards the late 1970s and going into the 80s, the dance company was undergoing a professional and cultural shift in the studio. Emma Ramos, um, who enrolled all of her children to dance with the Ballet Fricorico in the early 1960s as a way to preserve her, um, her own cultural traditions um, always saw great potential in the dance company to really make a difference in San Antonio. In the early 1980s, Emma Ramos became the executive director of the Ballet Fricorico de San Antonio and business became a family affair. Emma pushed for more visibility, more performances and more respect from the larger San Antonio community to really end the narrative of her company as being exotic or a cute display of Mexico, Emma worked with the Consulado de Mexico here in San Antonio to invite maestros or dance teachers from Mexico who had spent their whole career learning and teaching ballet for Corico uh, to retrain her, her group of students. Um, Emma was looking to transform her company into an educational and cultural institution. The maestros from Mexico came in and rebuilt the students and the Ramos family's um, understanding of Ballet Fricorico and what these dances really represent. The Ramos family came to learn that each dance represents a certain region in Mexico. Each aspect of the dance's costuming are references to specific cultural characteristics of that region. And each dance step and technique represents certain aspects of that region's history. What Ballet Fricorico is, is a living archive of diverse Mexican culture um, that has not, and in some ways cannot really be preserved in traditional forms of documentation, such as books or articles. Performing these dances is like paying homage to the buried roots of Mexican communities. So it's important to execute them accurately, respectfully, and with pride. With this new understanding, um, Emma had a new focus with the dance group and that was to raise this company and Focorico as a whole to the status of the professional art. The Ballet Focorico brought, brought in more maestros who specialized in various regions in Mexico and dance techniques ranging from flamenco to Focorico. Her students were refining their skills and gaining a deeper appreciation for their culture. Mexican culture would not live dormant inside them but radiate through them, empowering them to follow their artistic passions and other passions they might have in life. Emma Ramos and the Ballet Fricorico were building a community and carving a space for Mexican art within the mainstream Western culture. Legitimizing Ballet Fricorico as a respectful art form alongside European dance genres like ballet, jazz, and contemporary was inadvertently uh, legitimizing the status of Mexican Americans within the larger American society. Emma was slowly building the company's professional dance image that would not only be recognized in San Antonio, but around the country and across the border. Uh, the Ballet Fricorico de San Antonio would tour across the country in places like California and Ohio throughout the 1980s, proudly showing off their skills and encouraging Latino communities in those areas to openly celebrate their traditions as well. Um, they toured throughout Mexico in the mid 1980s. Um, and Mexican Fricorico dance companies in Mexico were utterly impressed with the, the small American dance troupe as their technique and knowledge were up to par with their standards. And Emma knew that they would be, that's what she was working towards. Here in San Antonio, the Ballet Fricorico uh, came to dominate the Fricorico scene and gain the respect they truly deserved. The dance company received several city pro proclamations from mayors uh, ranging from Henry Cisneros to Nelson Wolf. This cemented them as a valuable aspect of San Antonio society. Their talent was widely recognized across the city and across cultures. One of the most enduring and most public gigs was at the Arneson River Theater every weekend for almost 20 years, starting in the 1970s. They performed in front of all groups of people, uh, staking a claim, staking the Mexican American community's claim as an essential and beautiful part of San Antonio's heritage. Going into the 90s, the Ballet Fricorico cut ties with the city, uh, which initially worried the students and the Ramos children. However, Emma was quoted as saying, we were here before them and we'll still be here without them. 
Um, she was confident in the skill and experience of her dancers and especially of her own kids um, that they had retained from decades of performing and learning on the go. They started to focus more on local initiatives and local performances and really just wanted to build the next generation of Mexican artists. As mentioned, the Ballet Folklorico served as the jumping off point for many prominent folklorico and flamenco artists throughout Texas, such as Sergio Martinez, uh, Jose Godinez, and Elsa Champion. Emma transferred the leadership onto her daughter, Miss Bonnie Ramos, in the early 2000s. And she, alongside her husband, uh, Mark Molina, have been the executive artistic directors ever since. Ms. Bonnie Ramos has been my main community partner throughout my project and has really opened my eyes to the, the professional, dedicated world of Vale, vale Focorico throughout Texas. So why is this important? And, and what am I doing to, to preserve this history um, and achieve whatever it is that I'm working towards? So why is it important to preserve this history? And what have I been doing to achieve that? Well, I'd first like to reiterate that there is little, little literature or scholarship written about the cultural significance of each Flocorico dance and of Flocorico as the genre um, and its evolution throughout time and especially throughout the United States, uh, which is interesting to me because I think every San Antonio native or resident can associate Vale Flocorico as an essential ingredient in the city's larger cultural centers and cultural events, such as Fiesta, uh, the Texas Folklife Festival, the Market Square, and even Fiesta Texas. Um, I've learned that the knowledge of Ballet Focorico was mostly passed down through tradition, through experience, and through oral history. Um, whatever documents are written on Ballet Focorico, they are handwritten <laughs> and they will wear in time. Um, and the people will wear over time and leave us and their stories will be lost. So one of the first things that I did was set up oral histories with Miss Bonnie Ramos and with Mark and um, they appointed me in the direction of other folklorico artists in the city. And I've spent a lot of time talking with them, um, getting their perspective on the dance genre, on the art um, and, and why they think that performing Ballet Folklorico and documenting this what I'm doing is important. Throughout all of these oral histories I've conducted, um, and even in just day-to-day -day conversations that I've had with the Ramos family, um, these artists remind me that it's much more than just dancing. It's, it's getting in touch with your roots and defending where you come from and defending your legitimacy in, in being here in the United States and especially in San Antonio. So in documenting this history, we're tapping into one of the many cultural struggle, struggles that Mexican communities face um, or have faced and still face today um, in San Antonio, throughout Texas and throughout the Southwest in the United States. Ultimately, I'm trying to capture these stories of resilience through art. Um, in addition to the oral histories that I've been conducting, I've been digitizing the Ramos family and their dance studios, um, personal archives. So that's old photos, um, newspapers. Um, and that gives me a glimpse into the evolving narrative of Ballet Flocorico in San Antonio. Whereas before it was just this exotic, cute display of a foreign country, it is now regarded as an empowering um, movement of history and um, beauty throughout the city. And the narrative definitely changes from um, English printed, English, English, English language newspapers versus uh, Spanish language news, newspapers like La Prensa. Um, I will compile these, these primary sources and my own secondary commentary as long as other secondary sources that I have found um, on Ballet Focorico and on this dance studio into a digital site. Um, I'm aiming for this to be an educational and entertaining resource for um, researchers and for just local residents in San Antonio. Um, I want to do my part in designating the work of the Ballet Focorico de San Antonio um, and Ballet Focorico as a dance genre as a professional, profound and historical art form. Um, and create a space for Mexican communities to enjoy a bit of their culture and say, like, yes, this is history. I'm part of history and our traditions are historical and legitimate. So 
um, that's that's my capstone in my research in a nutshell. And um, so thank you for letting me share um, a bit of my research that I've done throughout this year and um, giving you a glimpse into my capstone and what I hope to accomplish um, by the end of the summer. Um, so thank you very much and um, have a good day. Hello, my name is Edgar Velasquez Renald, and I am a graduate student here at St. Mary's in the public history department. And I will be discussing a little bit about my uh, current research, which is on Laredito. So let me share my uh, screen here. Okay. In San Antonio, the rise of tourism and attempts at beautification affected the Mexican-American community of Laredito. In the 1850s, the demand for commercial space near military and main plaza uh, by Anglos pushed the community west of the San Pedro Creek. The jacales uh, built by the working class Mexican-American community in the public squares of uh, Main Plaza, Military Plaza, Alamo Plaza were uh, raised um, after they were pushed westward. Due to the neglect by the Anglo elite that took control of the city from Tejanos, the neighborhood west of the creek became segregated and economically disadvantaged. Okay, so here uh, we have some images of Military Plaza uh, circa the 1890s and a bird's eye view of Main and Military Plaza. So here you can see uh, San Fernando um, Church. And here you, in this picture on the left, you see um, its um, old facade, the Spanish style as opposed to um, the French style that um, the Anglos um, uh, created for the church to give it a little bit more worldly appeal um, in their eyes. Um, despite being moved west of the San Pedro Creek, the community remained linked to the plazas, both economically and culturally. Uh, San Fernando remained the community's church and public celebrations like the uh, uh, Mexican Independence Day uh, continue to be celebrated at the plazas. Most importantly, Mexican Americans continue to conduct business at the plazas as vendors continue to sell from their uh, puestecitos. Uh, the mayor at the time, Mayor Callahan, uh, sought to beautify um, the main plazas and districts uh, with the wealthiest Anglo San Antonians. Um, Laredito became an important commercial commodity. Um, simultaneously. So the colonial era villas and main plazas west of the river uh, provided Anglo tourists with a uh, picturesque, exotic, and uh, whitewashed experience of San Antonio. Meanwhile, Laredito, um, the Mexican American neighborhood, uh, local Anglos considered slums, um, became tourist attractions for those seeking to experience the unchanged uh, Mexican customs. You know, they felt that they were going uh, somewhere gritty and real. By the 1880s, Mayor Callahan sought to modernize a uh, military plaza, which remained the last main plaza that hadn't been restored. He pushed all Mexican vendors and chili queens uh, west of the creek. So now they really weren't able to uh, conduct business there anymore as they used to. So now they were conducting business around Haymarket Plaza. Uh, and also they would travel to Alamo Plaza for business. And that kind of helped um, perpetuate this image of uh, San Antonio being this exotic locale with um, uh, these Mexican customs. 
Uh, at the same time, Callahan also moved all vice businesses, such as gambling and prostitution, west of the creek, uh, creating an even more negative image of the community. Uh, this district became known as uh, the Sporting District, with segregation, uh, poor living conditions due to the city officials' uh, neglect, and a red light district, the Anglo elite created poor living conditions for the Mexican American community. They then would turn around and call slums, but also exploit. Um, in 1893, the city beautiful movement became popular after the Columbian exposition in Chicago. The movement was a response to growing tenement districts due to many factors, which included immigration. So in San Antonio, um, yes, there were um, lots of immigrants coming here, but there was also the population um, that was already here to begin with that was uh, consistently being marginalized. The planning and architecture of the Exposition's White City, um, as we could see here in these pictures, uh, physically demonstrated the movement's um, major tenets of creating a grand and beautiful city based on clean, defined streets with attractive buildings, uh, modern transport, and invisible pro uh, poverty, which is what um, San Antonio realized they needed to do after uh, years of neglect for uh, the West Side community. So these are Sanborn maps. Um, the one on the left is uh, from 1904 and the, the one on the right is from 1912. And we could kind of see how the neighborhood is starting to be developed, to be improved and modernized um, and take away um, the slum qualities of it. So in the 1904 map, um, you could see these beige or tan uh, um, squares. And th that, those are adobe buildings. And if you look at the right at the 1912 map, you can see that they start to disappear. They start to disappear with um, this pink uh, blocks. So those are brick and mortar buildings. So we really start to see how um, the city realized that they need to develop this and modernize it and beautify it despite it being in um, Laredito in the Mexican American community. And also as that happens, there's still an encroachment uh, going on. So in the 1904 uh, map, we could see, uh, this is too small uh, for you to see, but um, we can see that there are businesses like tamal stands or, um, a tortilla factories and there's that in abundance here as opposed to the 1912 map you could see that those businesses start to diminish they're still there but they're slowly being uh again moved westward um here we have an article from the daily mail um from 1910 the paper endorses the removal of adobe buildings for more modern buildings the wording of the article expresses the same type of othering that occurred when city officials exploited the image of the Mexican culture for Anglo tourists while simultaneously marginalizing the community. It suggests that the neighborhood with adobe buildings is anti antiquated and uh, poor living conditions are because of the community as opposed to something that's been inflicted upon them. Despite this, uh, the community uh, continue to endure, uh, but also uh, thrive. Um, as the population grew, the Mexican American uh, community expanded throughout the West Side, but Laredito continued to be a business center for the community. Um, in 1941, um, Eisenhower closed the sporting district um, during his command of Fort Houston. Um, and by this time, the Mexican American community um, began to diversify. You know, at the end of World War II, uh, many uh, veterans returned home. Um, elite exiled Mexicans uh, from the Mexican Revolution uh, contributed to helping the working class, and the working class, um, you know, 
um, started to uh, fight for rights, labor rights. So you really just uh, see the an identity being formed and um, the community really becoming autonomous and um, proclaiming their rights. And um, yeah, I will be continuing this research and hoping I find more looking through the maps. I want to see what businesses were there and hopefully find who owned them to create a clear picture of what Laredito was like. So thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Noemi Nandin, presenting El Color del Amor, the Color of Love. For the past four years, I have been working with women who have experienced intimate partner violence. Today, I want to share a little bit about their story, their art, and how they've inspired me to continue researching this topic. It is through their stories that got me thinking about a lot of questions about how we got here and how we move on and what can we learn. When I first met them and heard their stories, actually, they reminded me a lot of my family. And they reminded me a little of me as well. Sometimes women struggle with talking about their story in fear of speaking negatively about their families. She so just don't do that. So we tried other things, right? Um, breathing exercises and creative exercises. And one of the things that we did, two of the things that we did are these two art exercises. One of them is this mask. And usually we tell them, maybe describe your past and your present. Or maybe how do people view you and how you really view yourself on the inside? Once we were done with all the masks, we created this huge canvas and we lined them up to, to show the cycle of violence. They were very emotional. They were also very proud of their work. I was very proud of their work. The second one we did was called the Worry Dolls. And what we do there is every color, every shape represents something you want to leave behind. And usually we did that with breathing also. We combined it with other tools so that they can begin that processing of healing. So that really inspired me to really look deeper into what is intimate partner violence? How did we get here? How is this part of the systemic oppression we talk about? So what is intimate partner violence, right? The CDC describes it as a preventable problem that affects the health of millions of Americans. The violence can be physical, sexual, stalking, psychological, and can be caused by a current or former partner or spouse. It does not require sexual intimacy. This violence can happen among heterosexuals and same-sex marriages. The World Health Organization describes it or actually what I wanna add here is what they added was emotional abuse and controlling behaviors as intimate partners, violence. And also that it can exist in all socioeconomic levels, in all religions and all cultural settings. The impact of intimate partner violence. According to the CDC, one of four women experience a form of intimate partner violence. I know that today in our audience, there are women, there are people experiencing intimate partner violence. 
Unfortunately, Latina women have more significant symptoms of depression, low self-esteem and anxiety than non-Latina women who experience intimate partner violence. And the rates among minority women compared to white women, they're just much higher. Right now, it's actually um, because of the pandemic, the police department in San Antonio alone, they're receiving so many more calls, increased calls, like 18% since 2019 to 2020, because women aren't able to, to get away or make phone calls in order to leave a possible dangerous situation. And this is affecting families in a global scale. We still don't know how much so. We know that women have experienced oppression for centuries from the very beginning. There were really no laws to protect women. It was more laws to protect men and how they treated women. They, men expected for women to be submissive. You can go far back into the history of how society has treated women. Aristotle believed that women should not be in politics or public life. Darwin compared women's brains, adult women's, women's brains to that of a child. M medieval canon laws allowed men to discipline their wives. As the Aztec society, from the very beginning, you saw those gender specific roles that protected the male children over the female. And they also were just privileged in that way. Uh, young boys are taught, you know, metal work and hunting and women are taught to have children, cooking and cleaning. So it's been there from the beginning, right? And so I wanna know, how do we move forward? It wasn't until the rise of feminism really that things started changing. There were some amazing women who advocated for themselves and for others, and they got a lot done. These women, um, they blame systemic issues of education and upbringing for the oppression because it's true. We weren't allowed at the time to have a voice. And that was the beginning of us having a voice. It wasn't until 1920 when we got the right to vote, other countries started giving the right to vote to women that things started changing somewhat. Prior to 1971, all laws that were classified by sex, it was constitutional. In 1970 was the second wave of feminism fought for equality. One of the other things that I th has hel uh, not helped um, Latino women is, so we not only have the laws that weren't protecting us, sometimes just the definitions of what is intimate partner violence. Women, women who, non-Latino women who experience intimate partner violence do not describe abuse the same way as Latino women. A lot of Latino women do not consider certain things abuse. And that's just an upbringing, right? It is important still to today um, 
in a Latino culture, there are strict gender roles. One, of, one other word that came up uh, when I was talking to these women was the word aguantar, right, to endure. And this is the belief that Latinas have to endure a lifetime commitment no matter what, because marriage stipulates that the relationship is not essential, especially once that you're married and if you have children, really doesn't matter what women feel, think, want. Again, the oppression continues in, in that aspect. But what I also learned from these women and what I continue to research is the amount of resiliency that these women had have actually. And I always ask like, how did you get through it? How did you get to the other side? And usually you'll get a lot of different answers. It's different for everybody. But we do know that sometimes it's spirituality, sometimes it's just humor, creativity, going to therapy, group therapy, seeking help. So it's important that those external factors are there because it's needed in order to stay resilient. There are a lot of common themes for resiliency among Latino families. They are part of the culture and the things that they say and the details that they say. An author shared one detail, right? Querer es poder, which translates to where there is a will, there is a way, which he feels reflects the determination, a sense of resiliency. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you listening. And if you know anybody who might need help, here is the information. Thank you. Hola, I'm Virginia Garcia. Most people know me as Vicky. I'm a student in the PhD program for counselor education but I'm not gonna be talking about counseling research today. As a Chicana, my uh, direction has been heavily influenced by my heritage and my skin color and literally um, where I am on the map, which is Laredo, Texas. So sometimes we enter higher ed and discover anti-racist movements and other struggles for justice. But in my case, I think it was reversed in that I come from an activist background and I decided to return to school to research and influence spaces that don't often hear voices like ours. So today I'm going to tell you uh, about a first person account of witnessing a, a fight um, against the symbol of hate and racism, which is, is the border wall in our borderlands. So when I moved to Laredo, um, the first border uh, barrier that I saw was actually this one. It's actually about a mile long and it surrounds the local community college. And I didn't think much of it because it's only slightly taller than a household fence. The gates are often open and I didn't realize that it was part of the 2006 Secure Fences Act that was supposed to be 2000 miles of border fence ended up being much, much less. The fence idea had gone back and forth in the name of, of border security. Um, we hear uh, Representative Cuellar in uh, 2010, talk about how offense is not the solution to the increasing violence of, of drug cartels and, and the uptick in unauthorized persons at the border. Laredo, though, then and now continues to be one of the safest cities in the country. But in 2014, we did see um, waves of Central Americans, uh, mostly women and children seeking asylum. And we started the Laredo Humanitarian Re Relief Team um, to address hunger and homelessness, not violence, or the threat to integrity of our uh, country. The community's lived experience is important. It's not only about Homeland Security's numbers. Um, then we saw the start of the campaign um, for presidency by Donald Trump. His central uh, promise was to build a, a border wall along the entire political border. He made immigration his biggest target. Uh, this hadn't hit Laredo um, yet until the billions were uh, allocated. Um, supposedly Mexico was gonna pay for it, but really it's our tax dollars. But it alarmed uh, residents and uh, property owners to discover that Laredo was actually ground zero for wall construction. 
So there were early stakeholder meetings hosted by DHS. Um, and uh, I, I think there was a lack of recognition that uh, this area has families that trace generations back to Spanish land grants, um, that the, the um, Coahuiltecan also lived in this area and continue uh, to have ancestors and ancestry in this area. So this threat propelled everyone to action. Uh, first, it was against the declaration of the national emergency. And you'll see that, that it actually waived over 28 protection acts that would permit the destruction of ecologically sensitive areas. And we are sitting on one of the most endangered rivers um, in the world, according to UNESCO. So I'm part of the Laredo Immigrant Alliance. So we also had an interest in health and welfare of immigrants whose deaths we see grow with every single policy change um, because it changes migration patterns. So we began to see um, different groups um, having their own actions in different at different times. Um, so we saw from op-ed letters to demonstrations, we also began to see the lawsuits. Uh, the Rio Grande International Study Center was one of the first to, to fight against the national uh, emergency declaration um, but we also saw property owners like in Zapata who came together to sue because of property rights. So the movement began to grow and it coalesced into uh, a new coalition called the No Border uh, Wall Coalition. Um, the proposed wall, it really was going to start at only 14 miles, but it was supposed to be 30 feet high and it was going to um, go inland so far that it was going to destroy entire neighborhoods um, it was going to actually destroy the longest stretch of contiguous Hispanic historic architecture, in addition to, of course, the habitats of multiple native fragile animal species. And of course, the impact to humans was, was humans like me who live just four blocks from the border. So this multiple group effort um, was building and building, on, building and building until uh, then came COVID. But uh, we began to continue to meet virtually and uh, we planned protests like this ghost protest and we had car parades and we racked our brains and came up with the, a Black Lives Matter inspired street mural which propelled action at breakneck speed. So I'm gonna take a breather and show you this video that tells a little bit more about the story. Right now, Laredo faces one of the biggest challenges in its history. As longtime Laredoans, we love our city. We're proud of our history. We value our public places, our connection to each other, and to our river. When our city is threatened, we take a stand. At this very moment, the federal government is pushing through a dangerous project that would harm our city, creating a false sense of crisis that does not actually exist here. While pushing aside over 25 laws to deprive our community of equal rights and constitutional protections. We have seen the official plans. It is not just a fence. It is a 30 foot tall wall that will carve a path of destruction through our city, half the width of a football field, impacting everyone who lives in Laredo. The wall would cripple many of our beloved public spaces, our neighborhoods and homes, ranches and small businesses, historic structures and houses of worship. It would cut us off from contact with the source of all life here, our river. It would make many of our communities feel imprisoned. It would disrupt our wildlife, our ecosystems, and it would derail the city's master plan to provide economic development, ecotourism, and downtown revitalization. And the cost? $275 million for 14 miles, almost $20 million a mile. Instead of funding a wall, we could be funding our future. My name is Trisha Cortez. My name is Sancho Lopez. My name is Shirley Laurent. I'm a daughter, a mother. So you did There's good news. The wall is not a done deal. Together, we can stop it. But it requires our elected officials to stand with us. Our numbers are growing every day, and our coalition is expanding. Today, we ask that you join us in supporting this new campaign. We defund the wall, fund our future. We can show the country that we. So we began with an arts-based visual campaign around the defunding uh, the wall and funding our future. And 
We produced multiple memes, new groups formed, there were new campaigns. This was a bipartisan effort. I know that uh, it may seem like it's not, for example, in this picture, uh, there was only one small segment that did not uh, agree with us, but um, I think many people have recognized the hurt to our communities in, in the cutting off of tourism and our bread and butter because we are the largest inland port. But we did have events like this concert that uh, is still available. You are welcome to, to listen to it. But despite um, President Biden winning the November election, uh, surveying continued and landowners were signing uh, rights of entry to and or receiving threats of uh, eventual eminent domain. So we continued our efforts and we actually reached out to additional um, communities so that we began to form a new coalition um, titled the Border Allies. And so this Border Allies group is, is formed from people from all the way from San Diego to, um, to Brownsville, Texas. And we continue our efforts with, um, with not just fighting against the wall, but now fighting against militarization that is coming to our communities and it actually is impacting the fiber of all of our border towns. So I think one of the things to, to take away from, from this presentation today is that um, to understand Laredo and that it is over 90% Latinx, mostly Mexican American, you can imagine the efforts that it, it, it um, that came through and that came through to put together, to push, to delay, to fight against uh, this racist monument that hurt not just our community but actually hurt us as as Mexican Americans living in the U.S., living in our own Nepantla. So I want to thank you very much, and I hope that you do support uh, the No Border Walk Coalition. Feel free to um, visit our our, uh, our uh, websites and um, become involved. Become involved in preserving life uh, for border communities. Thank you.